Welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research virtually. My name is Alex Weiser, I'm the Director of Public Programs of YIVO. And we're really pleased to have you here with us for another installation of our Yiddish Civilization Lecture Series, which is a series that introduces audience and students alike to the broad, um, the breadth and the depth of Yiddish language culture. Um, and today we're really pleased to have Dr. Nina Varnke with us um, for a talk on women and the immigrant Yiddish stage, Paths to Stardom. Um, before I tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Varnke, I'm gonna hand it over to our academic director, uh, David Brown, academic director of our summer program. I just wanna briefly say welcome, Nina. Pleasure to have you and pleasure to have you back at the Zummer program of Nomen von Uriel Weinreich, the intensive Yiddish summer program at YIVO. Uh, I wanna make it known that Nina was our director a good couple of decades ago, and it was wonderful to get, her know, to, get to know her back in those days, and it is a pleasure having her back. That's all I have to say. I don't wanna take up from your time of a wonderful talk. So Thank just you. to say a little bit more about Dr. Varnke, um, Nina Varnke is a scholar of Yiddish literature and culture with a focus on theater. Her research has concentrated on the intersection of immigrant Yiddish theater, cultural politics, and the press, Yiddish reimaginations of Shylock on stage and in literature, Yiddish theater in a transnational context, and the role of gender in the Yiddish theater. Her most recent article, New York Yiddish Star Actresses and Their Self-Enactment in Memoirs, is forthcoming in Women on the Yiddish Stage, edited by Elisa Quint and Amanda Siegel. Um, among her other scholarly publications are Yiddish Shylocks in Theater and Literature, co-authored with Jeffrey Chandler, Patrioten and Their Stars, Male Youth Culture um, in the Galleries of the New York Yiddish Theater, and Going East, The Impact of American Yiddish Plays and Players on the Yiddish Stage in Tsarist Russia, 1895 to 1914. Nina has been teaching Yiddish language, literature, and culture at various universities around the U.S. and is currently teaching at Gratz College and at YIVO. Um, Dr. Varnka, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you both. Ashenem uh, Dankeich for the invitation as well as um, for your warm welcome. Um, I want to uh, start by sharing my screen and um, give you a little bit of a moment here to uh, see some of the visuals, which you will continue to see throughout uh, my, my talk. So let's get started. I have a lot to say, a lot to tell. Um, when the Yiddish prima donna Sophie Karp died in New York in 1904, around the age of 45, she was remembered as the first female actor to perform on the Yiddish stage and the first woman to co-own a Yiddish theater in New uh, a Yiddish theater. Born in Romania to poor parents, she worked as a seamstress when Avram Goldfaden's small troupe, consisting at the time of three male actors, performed there in 1877, only months after he had assembled his first theatrical company. Realizing the need for female performers in order to lift the theater, uh, from its wine cellar roots and imbue an element of middle-class respectability, Goldfaden invited Sophie to join the troupe, thanks to her appealing singing voice. Hang on. Um, <clears throat> she quickly married one of the troupe's actors in order to circumvent her parents' refusal to act. Uh, to let her act. After years of traveling with her husband in various companies, the actor manager Karp uh, brought Sophie, now a prima donna, that is a leading lady, to New York in 1885, where she soon married him after her divorce from her first husband. And here I just want to point out briefly, um, this is of course Goldfaden, um, replicated multiple times on all the sheet music of his famous operettas and a photo of him with a troupe, mostly males, except for one young woman who might be her, might be Bina Abramovich and uh, Goldfaden's wife. Um, 
And this is Sophie Karp. For the following decade, she and Max Karp were a beloved star team of musical theater, primarily consisting of historical operettas of by Goldfaden, uh, Joseph Lateina, and others. However, by the mid 1890s, Sophie found herself under increasing pressure as younger and more educated prima donnas um, re were recruited to New York and as serious drama made inroads into the repertoire, challenging the primacy of historical and comical operettas, which had been the staple of the first 25 years of the theater's existence. As she felt sidelined by the prominent actor managers, she, along with Latina, who had written many roles for her, commissioned a real, the real estate developer, Harry Fisher, to build the Grand Theater on New York's Lower East Side. Opening in 1903, the Grand was the first uh, theater building ever to be erected for the Yiddish stage. According to her obituary, in the Yiddish daily uh, Vorwärts, she claimed that she, quote, wanted to have a home of her own, unquote, where she would not, quote, be oppressed by the manager, the star, or his wife, unquote. This dream, however, lasted only a few months. She and her company could not attract enough of an audience to fill the 2000 seat auditorium, making it impossible to pay the high rent. They invited Adler, um, to join them, and after a fierce personal and legal battle, he took control of the theater. Carp died within months of pneumonia. As a middle-aged prima donna and a performer of historical operas, her ambition to run a, her own theater came too late. As a woman, this ambition came too early. And um, here you can see her through the years. The last picture on the right shows her in December 1903, about three, four months before her death. Um, and shortly after the takeover of by Jacob P. Adler. And I think one can see it in her face um, that she is, uh, she is tired and frustrated. Now here is the Grand Theater, uh, a view of the inside and an iconic picture of, of the Grand, ironically, with Jacob P. Adler's in uh, The Broken Hearts, Gebrochene Herze, um, which was the play which introduced him onto the stage uh, of the Grand Theater. And a lot of people assume that the Grand Theater was built for him rather than for her. Um, Karp was not the only female lead actress who saw, sought more control over repertoire and independence from the dominant actor managers. By tracing the careers of several star actresses born between the 1850s and 1870s and being prominent in New York between the 1890s and 1910s, I want to highlight the agency they developed in order to further their careers, limitations notwithstanding. An agency, I must add, that has often been eliminated from the narrative. By focusing on them, I will offer an alternate reading uh, to the standard historiography of Yiddish theater. But first a bit of background to contextualize both Karp's story and to offer a glimpse of the dominant uh, narrative. As a secular entertainment institution presenting full length plays, Yiddish theater was a late phenomenon, even within the East European context in which it first appeared. As a result of the increasing secularization of East European Jewry in the second half of the 19th century, it was first conceived, uh, conceived of in 1876 by Goldfaden as a tool of the Haskalah or the Jewish enlightenment. Within the first five years, its geographic area was limited to Romania, Ukraine, and Bessarabia. Within 15 years, that is by the early 1890s, we find Yiddish theater troops all over Europe, as well as in the US. The enormous expansion of Yiddish theater in such a short time is evidence uh, of its great popularity, but is also the result of the high level of mobility of Jews during these years, both within Europe and of course to the United States and Canada among other countries. Between 1881 and 1920, some 6 million 
uh, Jews left Eastern, South, Southeastern and Central Europe uh, to escape economic hardship and the increasing anti-Jewish violence and oppression. Actors and playwrights joined the exodus after the Russian authorities banned performances in Yiddish in 1883. While this put, uh, did not put a complete end to performances there, it did put troops at the mercy of local authorities, leading to several years of stagnation, especially when compared to New York. By 1890, we need to remember, New York had become the world center of Yiddish theater, uh, theatrical activity, boasting three large theaters, dozens of actors, and several playwrights. Rapid urbanization, secularization, and mass immigration during the years that the Yiddish theater came into being destabilized traditional family structures and definitions of gender roles and opened new opportunities for women, as well as for men, of course. Even for young women of low economic status and with limited education, the newly established theater offered an escape from the predictable drudgery of work as skilled or unskilled laborers, peddlers, or domestics. Instead, they could build on their musical talents and turn this gift into a profession. This new realm of professional activity promised a level of self-realization previously unheard of. In fact, there was no other professional arena where these young women could have achieved such prominence and have a career rather than an occupation to earn a livelihood in order to support a family. For many young girls, the opportunities that the theater promised came at a price, conflict with parents and often rupture with the family. After all, performing thrust this generation of young Jewish women and men into a public heterosexual sphere. Moreover, according to Halakha, the Jewish law, women are not supposed to sing in public since men who are not close family members are forbidden to listen to a woman's voice, kolisha. While they themselves may have no longer adhered to the prohibition, um, and may have sung in the presence of friends and co-workers, stepping onto a stage defied all expectations of female modesty and must have taken considerable courage. Many young women married fellow actors relatively quickly after joining a troupe. Early marriage was not only cultural norm for young traveling actresses, it provided respectability, protection from unwanted uh, sexual advances by other men, and more status and security within a troupe. Most women who married outside the theater gave up their careers. Only a stable theater, such as in Lemberg, London, or New York, offered uh, uh, such women the opportunity to continue their careers after marriage. The patriarchal uh, infrastructure of the theater was a result of entrenched societal patterns and gender roles, but it was also ideologically anchored in the creation of modern national Yiddish culture. Within a few years of its beginnings in 1876, Yiddish theater was charged with a mission to hasten the entry of East European Jewry into the modern world and create a cultural institution that could compare with the national cultures in Europe. Just as Sholem Aleichem conceived of the creation of Yiddish literature um, as a patrilinear undertaking, declaring himself the spiritual grandson to the grandfather of Yiddish literature, Mendele Moichas Forum, Goldfaden was uh, heralded as the father of Yiddish theater. The playwright Jacob Gordon, the so-called reformer, um, of the theater who began writing for the stage in the early 1890s in New York and introduced realism on stage, also considered himself a paternal figure. And I have forgotten to forward my slide here. Um, and here we see him in a, a picture of, of him down here uh, and posters of several um, productions of his. Um, he considered himself a paternal figure, albeit a father who had adopted Goldfaden's neglected child. He and the radical 
intellectual elite in New York attempted to free the Yiddish theater from historical operettas and other plays they considered shunned in order to lift it to the level of contemporary theater. Thus, those actors who joined Goldfaden in the early years, and particularly those who embraced Gordon's dramas and thereby helped the project of creating a modern stage became part of the central narrative. While others, and that would include most women uh, in the early decades were written out of the story. The narrative focusing on these two theatrical figures started to form almost as soon as they began their respective careers. When Zalman Zilbertzweig um, began his work on the seven volume Lexicon von Jüdischen Theater in the 1920s, he was able to draw on dozens of memoirs, historical accounts, including B. Goren's Geschichte von Jüdischen Theater and other sources which focused on the Goldfaden period as well as the well chronicled endeavor, endeavors by Gordon and other realist dramatists and the actors associated with their productions. Thus, many women's entrance, entries in this indispensable resource for Yiddish uh, theater scholars uh, focus on their start on, in the profession and their roles during the Goldfaden period. And if they married an actor, their entries would usually close with a remark such as, quote, after her marriage to ex actor X, her career followed the same path as his, unquote, presenting the woman's career as an extension of her husband's. In other words, we learn much less about their repertoire, their roles, their lives, and their agency. It is little wonder then that we have more anecdotes about Sophie Karp's first season on the stage when Goldfaden discovered her than information about the rest of her 30 year career. Similarly, we learn relatively little about the career uh, of Kenny Lipson before Gordon uh, wrote the first star vehicle for her in 1898. Bina Abramovich's biographical entry is another case in point. Her column length bio focuses on her childhood and first steps on the stage, mentions her marriages, but devotes less than half a paragraph to her 50 year career ending with a note that she was celebrated as Die Mame von Jüdischen Theater because of the serious mother roles she played and her decade-long association with the Yiddish art theater. By contrast, Kenny Lipson's and Berta Kalish's entries detail their careers at great length since they were the leading female proponents of Gordon's repertoire. Now let's look at some of the women's more in more detail. Kenny Lipson, the trailblazer. Uh, Lipson arrived in New York in 1888 from London, where she had been um, Jacob, Jacob P. Adler's leading lady. Even at that time, she already sought a, a, to build a repertoire with dramatic rather than operatic star roles, generally with translations into Yiddish. Widowed not long after her arrival in New York, she would marry the editor and journalist Michael Mintz around 1891, who promoted her through his publications and would eventually become her full-time manager. Not being married to a star manager, Lipson struggled at first to get the roles she desired. Her former, former acting partner, Adler, had married Sarah Heine. Sigmund, um, Sigmund Feynman would marry Adler's previous wife, Dina, and Boris Tomaszewski was married to Bessie. To varying degrees, they all competed for the few available dramatic roles, most of which were provided by Gordon. Among the actor managers at the time, only Dovid Kessler did not have an actress for a wife, and he became one of the few major male leads that female stars who did not have an actor husband could regularly partner with. After a season that started auspiciously because Gordon was a company dramatist for a few months, but, en um, but ended with her being completely sidelined, Lipson struck out on her own and pioneered a path to independent stardom. By not having a season engagement with a theater, she lost the more or less steady opportunity to perform and with, its, and with it the regular salary, but she had complete control over her repertoire. 
for years. She rented a theater for a week during the pre and post season for the holidays or at other opportunities and toured extensively throughout the season, first primarily in the Northeast and in later years throughout the country. Touring was certainly grueling, but over the years, she was able to build a remarkable career this way, primarily with the plays that Gordon wrote for her. Um, and here we see her, um, a placard from the Wilde Princessin from the, from the late 1890s um, with her uh, iconic image, which we'll see in a moment again. Um, she debut one of Gordon's plays in New York during week-long guest performances, which were advertised with great fanfare because she was there so rarely, and usually received extensive reviews in the Yiddish press. After all, those were Gordon's vehicles. And then she would take those productions on tour. And here we see a write-up in the New Haven Morning Journal and Courier um, with an image of hers here prominently featured. And we would find um, certainly a lot of um, co commentary, sometimes a review and certainly announcements in the English language press throughout the country when she would come to town. <clears throat> um, throughout, throughout the first decade of the 20th century, she had relatively little competition as a touring star during the season, since most other stars had full engagements in New York and could only travel occasional weekends. Lipton also stands out in that she was the only one who created a timeless iconic image that appeared in many of her advertisements throughout her career. The same drawing of a portrait from the early 1890s often framed by wreath-like flowers and branches. And so here we see her in, 80, uh, in 91 uh, with drawings of her most important dramatic roles at the time. Uh, and here the same image again um, a few years later. And this, essentially the same portrait in an ad from 1914. So she never aged. Uh, in 1906, she became the star in the Kalish Theater, named for Berta Kalish, who had accepted an engagement on Broadway, making this theater the first to be named for a female Yiddish star, albeit an absent one. Two years later, Lipson and her husband leased a small theater, a small theater on the Lower East Side, and of course renamed it the Lipson Theater. This period of relative stability came to a sudden end when Mintz committed suicide in 1912 due to the debts the theater had accumulated. Lipson vowed to pay back every penny and returned to her taxing touring schedule until shortly before her death. Regina Prager and Berta Kalisch were both recruited from Lemberg in the mid 1890s. And the two imported young prima donnas competed with Sophie Karp and of course were also pitched against each other. Praga um, remained a star on the musical theater for the rest of her career, rather than moving to dramatic roles. The lexicon, however, essentially skipped 20 years of her career between the late 1890s, shortly after she arrived, and the rediscovery, so to speak, by Rumshimsky and Tomaszewski in 1917. During these 20 years, Praga rarely had season contracts, but she forged her own career through regular guest performances. In 1904, she was a, the star in a, a theater in Harlem. And the following year, her husband leased the huge Windsor Theater on the Bowery for her, where she performed for several months. Her most steady stage partner was Kalman Juvelier, with whom she performed the, uh, formed the Praga Juvelier Opera Company in 1907, staging Goldfaden, Hurwitz, and Lateiner repertoire operettas from the international repertoire and contemporary Yiddish uh, operettas by uh, writers like Anshul Shor. She also re recorded a few dozen songs with various recording companies starting as early as 1904 and continued into the 1920s. 
Kalish um, transitioned to a more dramatic to more dramatic roles after a few years in New York, and was the second female star for whom Gordon wrote regularly wrote plays. The ambitious Kalish also advanced her career without a star act star actor husband, but like Lipson's husband, hers also served as a co-manager in various theaters uh, where she was engaged. She fashioned herself as the grande dame of Yiddish theater and chose to make a name for herself in several roles from the Ber Sarah Bernard repertoire. As one of Gordon's premier actresses, she was noted by American critics and theater professionals and frequently discussed in the Anglophone press. In 1905, she was invited to perform on Broadway and um, continued to perform exclusively in English for about a decade. After that, she split her time between the English and Yiddish stage, where she appeared mostly in her old repertoire. However, her acting style on both the English and a Yiddish stage was considered outdated and her performances became rarer until she retired from the stage around 1930. Kalish's successful transition to Broadway awakened hope in several other young actresses um, that they could follow in her footsteps. One of them was Malvina Lobel. Uh, when she arrived in New York in 1902, upon the invitation of Tomaszewski, she already had a considerable theatrical career behind her, despite her rather young age, uh, because she was the eldest daughter of the troupe director, Solomon Treitler. She debuted with great success as Tomaszewski's leading lady and got noticed in the New York Times a year later. And again in 1904, when she organized a benefit performance for the victims of the Slocum disaster, which was um, uh, over a thousand people uh, drowned when the Slocum um, when the Slocum sank in the East River. Most of those were uh, from the German immigrant community, um, and of course that was a, a big uh, deal at the time. 1907, she attempted to strike out on her own and briefly rented the Park Theater in Harlem, renaming it. Lobel's Park Theater being the second woman to put her name on a marquee. In 1908, she announced she would make her debut in English during her tour in England. The Anglophone, Anglophone Press um, repeatedly described her as Kalish's successor on the Yiddish stage. And you can sort of see this here, her announcement and the, um, the, uh, the mentioning Kalish as, um, as her, I, I, um, the one she is trying to uh, emulate. Um, although it is unclear if her plans ever came to fruition, according to her brief entry in the lexicon, she did perform once in English and once uh, in German. However, she was not able to make a more permanent career in another language. Lobel, who continued to uh, serve as a leading lady in various companies, particularly with Kessler, as we can see here, um, shows several Yiddish productions of recent Broadway hits uh, to help advance her career. But what about Sarah Adler and Bessie Tomaszewski? After all, by virtue of being married to the two reigning actor managers, they enjoyed instant name recognition and stable engagements. And they certainly enjoyed some cachet within the troupe as the wives of the boss. What must have seemed like a great advantage early in their marriages and joint careers was not necessarily so in the long run. Both acted for years in the shadows of their husbands. Jacob P. Adler and Boris Tomaszewski were known for their huge egos and usually made sure that they would not be upstaged. Both men often enhanced scripts by enlarging their roles and or cutting the lines from others, including those of their wives. So at a time when Lipson and Kalish were featured as great stars in ads, Sarah and Bessie rarely were. At best, they were featured with their husbands, such as Mr. and Madame Adler appear in. Uh, and we can sort of see this visually here. Um, they don't appear on their own, but always with their husbands, um, or 
in this case, Sarah's husband. In fact, in 1902, Sarah complained about her situation and that of fem female actors in general during an interview with the Falwells. At that time, Adler and Tomaszewski were co-managers of the Thalia. She explained that each of them makes de decisions that he believes is best for the theater, adding, and for himself. Quote, the result is that they forget about the actresses and don't give them any chances. I feel that I no longer have the same reputation as I used to. And that's entirely understandable. How many years has it been since I have performed a new role? But what can I do? Leave the people's theater? First of all, that's impossible. And second, what would happen in another theater? First, you get a lot of attention, and then you are treated no different than the other actresses. What seemed impossible in 1902, namely breaking away from the star husband, both women made a reality a decade later. But more about that in a moment. Not surprisingly, Sarah Adler's entry in the lexicon comprises one and a half columns to Jacob's 15. More than half of her biography focuses on her life and career before her marriage to Adler. The 30 years of her joint career with him are entirely omitted, except for a brief list of her main roles during that time. One paragraph is devoted to her solo activity, claiming that it started in 1917, when in fact it had started five years earlier. Considering that she was repeatedly hailed by critics, as the best realistic actress on the Yiddish stage, this lack of information about her is particularly disconcerting. Bessie Tomaszewski, Bessie Tomaszewski's entry is also much shorter than her husband's. However, it is considerably longer than Sarah's, in part because Zilbert Zweig could make use of the memoirs she had published in 1915. In fact, she was the first actor Yiddish actor, male or female, to publish book-length memoirs. Bessie's solo career, which started after her separation from Boris in, 19, um, in 1912, was also more extensive than Sarah's. While Bessie um, also performed in her husband's shadow during much of their time together, she was able to have some significant hits as a comic lead during the last five years with her husband, which began to position her as a star in her own right. And you can see her in the Grina Bocha, which is, I think, from around 1907. By the early 1910s, much had changed in the Yiddish theater business. With ever more actors clamoring to join the, the New York Yiddish theaters, competition had become increasingly fierce. There were always a handful of prominent actors who were not hired for the season or may have turned down an offer that seemed unappealing. Theater managers began to create circuits and send some of their players on tour, while others stayed in town, which allowed them to have larger casts. But other circuits also emerged independent of the theaters in New York, often with female stars at the helm. By 1908, the young enterprising Edwin R.A. Relkin had become a touring manager, showcasing various stars up and down the East Coast, as well as the Midwest and California. He worked extensively with Lipson, with Praga, Bessie Tomaszewski, Sarah Adler, Jenny Goldstein, who I haven't mentioned previously, Lobel, as well as, of course, the male stars, Kessler, um, Adler, and so on. Other summer tours, tour arrangements were formed as well. In 1914, for example, four managers banded together to create a circuit under the name Yiddish Theatrical Enterprises, with one theater in Boston, one in Newark, one in Philadelphia, and the fourth in Chicago. The four companies, according to the announcement, were led by Jacob P. Adler, Kenny Lipson, Bessie Tomaszewski, and Rosa Karp, the daughter of Sophie Karp, who had died in 1904. Female as well as male stars or actors stuck in middling career, acting careers in New York used touring and guest performing as a way to fulfill their desires for star roles and possibly to position themselves better upon return from a successful tour. In 1912, Malvina Lobel um, chose um, the Yiddish translations of Alexander Bisson's La Femme X and Walter Brown's Every Woman. Uh, huge hits on Broadway for her extended tour through Europe. 
And in, nine, in the summer of 1914, she repeated her tour and two years later traveled to Argentina. Another actress who took, whose career took off thanks to touring in Eastern Europe was Clara Young. The Galician-born Young had, had made her professional debut in 1903 in a New York music hall. Her career took off in 1909 when her husband Boaz Young became a partner in with Kessler at the Thalia Theater. And you can, if you can read it, you can see her his name up here, and of course hers prominently here. Both Youngs had star ambitions, and as early as 1910, Boaz made plans to break away from the Thalia and open a theater in Harlem. During Kessler's absence, he staged a play that featured Clara in her first leading role. During the summers of 1911 and 12, they toured England and Central Europe. Clara's performances had been such a success that shortly after their return to New York, Boas gave up his partnership in the newly built Second Avenue Theater and both went back to Poland. Their professional future in Warsaw looked much brighter than in the tightly controlled and competitive New York market. Um, New York market. In Warsaw, Clara became the darling of the audiences and of the Yiddish speaking intelligentsia. By 1914, they had plans to build their own theater, which came to nothing because of World War I. The two stayed in Europe during the war and Clara eventually emigrated to the Soviet Union. Instead of seeking greener pastures elsewhere, some female actors began to stand up for their rights as star performers. For example, in 1913, the star actress Clara Raffalo brought a loose lawsuit against Tomaszewski and his manager Edelstein for terminating her and her husband's contracts after she refused to play a secondary role in an out of town production. The court sided with her and awarded her $2,000 in damages even though her contract stipulated she play all roles she was assigned. She could successfully argue that the theater hired and advertised her as a prima donna and that she had explicitly asked in writing not to be cast in roles that would not suit her. A year later, Lipson broke her contract with Tomaszewski. She was being sent on tour after one major in-town production. As she said, she could tour uh, on her own just as well. And it seems that's what she did. But women began to show their independence in other ways as well in the early 1910s. Between 1912 and the late 1910s, quite a few female stars actively sought prominence on their own terms. While Kessler, Tomaszewski and Adler competed with each other in building brand new edifices for themselves on Second Avenue, Several star actresses put their names on the marquees of other theaters, capitalizing on the growing immigrant Yiddish, uh, Jewish immigrant community, which by that time had expanded uptown to Harlem and into the boroughs and could support an increasing number of theaters. What had seemed impossible to Sarah in 1902 became reality 10 years later. Not only did she leave her husband, even if only temporarily and not for the first time, but she also opened the novelty theater in Brooklyn under her name. She had great ambitions with a series of translated plays and new original Yiddish dramas, including one by Paulina Kobren. She hosted Rudolf Schildkraut, one of Max Reinhardt's star actors, as well as Bessie Tomaszewski, who had just left her husband and brought the young um, Jacob Ben Ami to the United States. While her theater ownership was brief, she would go on uh, to frequently perform independently as well as with her husband. Tomaszewski made her first independent splash hit soon after her separation with Rakov's Ranch in America and followed it with uh, his Weiberische Meluche in 1914. From 1915 through 18, Bessie held the directorship of the People's Theater, and we can see it here. Um, named Bessie Tomaszewski's People's Theater in direct opposition or comp competition with her husband's venue, Tomaszewski's National Theater. Between her European tours, 
Lobel also operated her own theater in 1913. Her husband, the physician Julius Broder, previously submitted 12 plays for copyright, uh, several of which were specially written for Madame Malvina Lobel, indicating that she also had great plans. She engaged Morris Moskowitz, a prominent second tier star actor who had received rave reviews on his tour in Warsaw and who eventually left the Yiddish stage for the British one. And here we can see some ads, um, Malvina Lobel's theater. Here's Regina Prager's Odeon theater. Um, there's the Lipson theater. And um, there's also the Sarah Atlas Theater right here. Although there, um, nope, I lost my place. Um, during that time, others, other women also opened their theaters um, and Rosa Karp was a co-manager of the Lennox Theater together with Bella Gudinski, um, Leon Blanc and Samuel Rosenstein. So women also created larger um, associations uh, with female and male actors. Several of them also starred in films, which of which uh, most of which um, premiered in 1914 or 15. And here we go. Um, Kalish, in fact, headed headlined five Bessie Tomaszewski and Malvina <clears throat> Lobel each starred in one. Sarah Adler, uh, Rosetta Cohn were each in two. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the men were not quite as prolific on <clears throat> in film. Um, None of the entries of the, in the lexicon, except for Bessie's and of course Lipson's, mentions the fact that they all ran theaters in their own names or that they were featured in films. <clears throat> Although their endeavors to head a theater were rather short-lived, anywhere from one to five seasons, this push by the female, these female stars occurred at a time when the suffragist movement and the question regarding equal rights for women became increasingly significant topics among Jewish immigrants, as well as the population at large. <clears throat> this de determination to break loose from dominating male stars and directors by, the, by this many women in a relatively short period is unique in the history of the Yiddish theater. It suggests a striving for female independence and empowerment congenial with the spirit of time and seems to emulate the inroads women had made on the American mainstream stage, both in regards to leadership and feminist voice. However, their repertoire often belied these aspirations. Most of the texts available to them were the ever popular fallen women melodramas, which presented married women who were seduced or started affairs and generally met with an unhappy end. Unlike the fictional women that they so often represented, they themselves lived more or less unconventional lives beyond the norms for female behavior still prescribed by society and reinforced in melodrama. Some of them had affairs and parted with their husbands and they all pursued professional lives and often in professional lives independent of their husbands and none suffered the inevitable consequences of stepping beyond the norms. Um, that is death or eternal misery as um, the characters um, that they embodied. <clears throat> However, despite the great inroads they made, their achievements were still limited by an entrenched patriarchal and paternalistic environment, which often viewed female actors with suspicion, especially those who had exhibited agency and self-determination. If this period of the 18, 1910s is mentioned in, at all in the historiography of Yiddish theater, it is generally described as a period of stagnation or decline, wedged as it was between the two golden ages, uh, dominated on the one hand by uh, playwright Gordon, who passed away in 1909, and on the other by Morris Schwartz, who opened his Yiddish art theater in 1919. 
It is a decade when the old order was slowly disintegrating, as the generation that had built the Yiddish theater in New York was aging. But looking at this decade from the margins, through touring, neighborhood theaters, and women's career trajectory, we can more accurately describe it as a period of instability and transition, which allowed for experimentation and gave room for an unprecedented involvement of women as heads of theaters and touring stars. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, we've got a little bit of time left for um, audience questions, and we've got a lot of questions already. Um, and if you have any other questions, please note those in the chat, and we'll do our best to get to them. Great. Um, first, I want to take a question from um, Dr. Sonia Golans, who we're going to hear on this series one week from today on a, on a very much related topic. So um, make sure to join us again for that. Um, Sonia asks, I'd be interested to hear more about the extent to which actresses were involved in selecting, developing, writing their repertoire. That is a difficult question um, and a lot more research needs to be done, especially for that uh, early period. I mean, we know that Molly Pecan was certainly involved in, uh, in the writing and certainly wrote her own uh, lyrics at times. Um, I think from what I understand, when they toured, well, first of all, they built relationships with certain playwrights that, and these playwrights would on occasion write for them, specifically for their um, personalities. So in that sense, they did choose um, something, but they, I don't think they had, they could direct the writers to write what they might have wanted. So um, I think agency was rather limited, um, at, but they also reached out to some female uh, playwrights. Uh, I think um, Adler or Tomaszewski did a play. Um, and as I mentioned, Paula Kobrin, Polina Kobrin's was at least considered. I don't think it was ever staged by Lobel, but um, the, they certainly tried to the degree that there was, they were able to. Fascinating. Um, there's also a, a whole que a question, a bunch of uh, conversation in the question uh, um, about um, sources that are available to um, English readers, translations of, um, of these memoirs or other sources that people can go to. Sonia um, has noted that the Digital Yiddish Theater Project has um, has translations. Um, Steve Lasky has also noted that through his Yiddish theater um, website, there are translations, um, other sources. Yes, thank you uh, both, of, both of you for that. Um, and uh, you uh, should also look out for the, um, the, the publication um, that we mentioned at the beginning, um, Women on the Yiddish Stage, which includes uh, a lot of articles in this case, um, I don't think any primary sources, the memoirs um, will be published uh, all on the digital theater project. Um, there are, um, most of the memoirs so far have not been translated. I know that there is a project um, of translating uh, Esther Rochel Kaminska's uh, memoirs. There are pieces of Kalish's memoirs that have been published. Um, but all of this is still very much a work in progress. And whoever wants to chip in with translations, go right ahead. Um, we received a bunch of questions about the physical layout of the theater world in New York. Um, and like where were all these theaters? You touched on it a little bit. Um, and also a related question about the, the Thalia theater that is um, in the Upper West Side, is that at all related to the? Okay, so the theaters started out on the Bowery uh, and essentially the Yiddish actors um, took control of the theaters that had been vacated by either German troops or um, the English language melodrama troops, all of which went uptown. Uptown at that point was Union Square. And then eventually it became um, 
uh, Broadway. But at the time, they they used those around the Bowery and the Grand Theater was still very close to the Bowery, just one block away. By the 1910s, they start building on Second Avenue. And that's what people know about. It's the sec Yiddish Theater on the Second Avenue. But this was a big step that Kessler's Theater and uh, Tomaszewski and Adler's Theater. And then in the 20s, um, there was yet another theater building um, on, on Second Avenue. Um, you mentioned the English melodrama um, world of that period. There, we, we have another question um, asking about comparisons to the melodrama, the contemporaneous mel uh, melodramas of other languages, um, other immigrant uh, theaters. Is there something to speak of and what can we say about them in relationship to each other? Or maybe that's a little bit a field for, for today, but. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a big question. Um, and I'm not an expert on, on other immigrant theaters. I know the Italian theater did exist, but not in the same way, um, not to the same extent um, that the Yiddish theater existed simply because the immigrant community was more one of um, going back and forth. They were not permanent. Um, and um, the German theater was certainly one that um, was very, uh, entrenched in, Germ in in on the Lower East Side in New York at the time. There were some back and forth between German and Yiddish um, actors um, who performed on each other's stages. And very often the German theater was used as a model um, primarily by those who wanted to have higher literature on the stage. Um, whereas those who were the others with the more musical theater were looking at Broadway. So it was a little bit of, a, you know, the, the European style theater versus the American style theater that sort of converged on the Yiddish stage. Um, that's a good segue to another question from a viewer, which is, can you talk a bit about the connection between East European um, Yiddish theater and American Yiddish theater? Was there a dialogue going back and forth, tours, um, the exchange of materials. Yes, and there are different periods that we need to uh, consider here. Um, so in the early period, um, actors and plays migrated west, right? Especially after the ban of Yiddish theater in, 19, in 1883. Um, now in 1905, Yiddish theater started to re-emerge and uh, theaters opened in Warsaw and other places, at which point um, also touring became much more, um, much more extensive and uh, Yiddish actors went even to, um, to Warsaw and other places. Before that, they would tour from New York pretty much every year, they went to Lemberg and other places to basically recruit all talent that they could find literally every year emptying out uh, what had just been developed there. Uh, so there was a lot of taking from Europe in terms of young stars, um, but a lot of the um, plays that were written in the United States were re-imported to uh, Eastern Europe. And in fact, by 1914, there were critics who said, there is just the Yiddish theater in, in Warsaw has become an American theater, essentially American Yiddish theater, because it was just swamped with American Yiddish plays. Of course, there were always individual actors who would bring uh, plays to the United States. So there was a dialogue. Uh, and in the 20s, the, the, the touring extended even further. Um, and um, think of Molly Pecan, who spent a couple of years in, in Eastern Europe um, and others. So it was a very intense exchange, I would say. Fascinating. And there's, there's obviously so much material. Um, and I see we have way more questions than we're going to get to. So my apologies in advance, but we'll try to get, a, get to a few more in the next few minutes. Um, Another interesting question from a viewer, your discussion of marriages and acting, uh, marriages and acting partners in particular has me thinking about what we know about the religious lives of the Jews who acted in the Yiddish theater or attended. And likewise, um, were there any 
noteworthy correlations between Yiddish theater and socio-political movements, such as anarchism or socialism and communism or Zionism? OK, those are two questions. And please help me remember the second one. Let me talk a little bit about um, so the religious aspect. Um, I would say that the vast majority uh, had really embraced a secular life. Opening night, after all, was Friday night, right? You went to, uh, that is when you didn't go to shul, you went to uh, the theater. So both the audience and the actors generally um, would, um, would come. Uh, and very few actors are known for keeping a religious life. And Regina Praga and Bina Abramovich, especially Regina Praga is um, sort of noted for that, um, that she would not perform on certain holidays or would not perform functions that were forbidden on Shabbos when she, when she was on stage on Shabbos. So she was also trying to balance the two, um, the career with, um, with um, you know, her beliefs and, uh, and traditions. Um, so I would say in most cases, religious life was not prominent uh, in those families. It was of course prominent on the stage. Um, it, was, it was staged, lots of scenes and Shabbos scenes and holiday scenes and so on and so forth. So it was evoked. Um, but um, I would say that is uh, sort of where it, where it stopped. Um, and the second question... The question was about the um, political connections of the Yiddish theater world. I would have to do a lot more research to see what there is. I mean, I think there is a certain kind of correlation between um, Gordon's plays and the, and the socialist movement and those actors who associated with with them, and there may have been actors who did not like their politics and might have also chosen, therefore, not to perform in them. However, um, I can't, I don't, I haven't seen anyone who would say, you know, I am a socialist or I belong to this party. They try to perform for everyone. Um, they would stage um, benefits for any party, any uh, organization that wanted them to stage something and they could find the play that would suit them. Um, I would say that Tomaszewski was probably the one who was the most clearly uh, Zionist from um, naming his son Theodor uh, to having uh, Hatikva on the stage, singing Hatikva and um, the Morgan Dovid in quite a few productions. Fascinating. Um, and as I said, we, there's so many great questions. So apologies that we can't get to all of them, um, but maybe we'll end with one more. Um, a question about uh, the role, the, the, the contributions that women made to the Yiddish theater and, and the way that that may or may not have translated to the um, kind of mainstream American stage. And you, you spoke about how some of these women um, worked in on Broadway. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, um, is this, is this um, do we see the same kind of trends in the mainstream uh, stage and how has that changed over time? The same trends as in, I'm uh, sorry, I, I might have missed. Of, of the of kind of women's role being underplayed or, or overlooked. Well, um, I'm not entirely certain. Uh, I think uh, the focus on actors' lives and performance histories is has not been as robust in terms of research um, anywhere. Um, there are there there are quite a few books, however, on some actresses who really took charge politically and were otherwise really um, engaged uh, socially. Um, and brought that on stage. So I'm not, I would think that the Yiddish actresses ultimately had 
from what I know, at least from that, that generation, I'm not talking about later ones, you know, we can talk about Stella Adler, um, but this generation um, did not really have a whole lot of impact on the, on the American stage. And I don't think had a lot of conversations with female actors from Broadway. Fascinating. Well, this has been uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, lecture. Thank you so much. And um, it's really exciting how much more exploration and work there is. There's lots of work for the next generation and for, for the continuing uh, current generation of scholars and for all of our students out there. Um, and in fact, we're going to return to theater um, with both of our lectures next week um, for, as a part of this series. So please do join us again. Um, and Dr. Varnka, thank you again. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to reading your comments in the chat. So thanks again.